Hello, and welcome to the Future Research Group interviews on research experiences. This interview is with the Australian visual artist Simon Mee, who has generously donated his time to give his thoughtful responses to a number of questions focused on research as an experimental process. Paintings and drawings by Simon are overlaid throughout the interview, selected to correspond to some of the ideas in his responses. It was an excellent interview and his enthusiasm and insights are greatly appreciated, so please enjoy. I mean, there's, there, I mean, there's things in there that I think are in common, and I'm sure, I mean, pe people, I mean, I've seen people trying to, you know, invoke the creative as if we're some kind of power of God thing. But I think, and I see a lot of um, scientists and creative en engineering and creative people like that, they have a very, follow a very similar process that, you know, the design loop. Yeah. 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 Which is you kind of, you have an idea, you test it, you draw your conclusions of what does and doesn't work. And, and then you kind of reflect and then start again and try different range of solutions. Yeah. I don't think really create people are that different. Um, in that respect, that we do the similar thing. We only really have a limited, Andrew McNamara once said, we only have a really a limited number of ideas. And I, I think that's a little unfair, but but also quite true at the same time, you know, <laughs> in the sense that when I look at my own practice over the last, since the 90s, um, there are certain things that just like, I could keep running, coming around to like a dog to its own vomit. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's, 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 it's um, and I, and I think that's part of that thing of things that fascinate you at the beginning often <laughs> are the things that drive you. Um, and, you um, know, it, it, it's the, it's the kind of thing that then why as you become older as a researcher, you go through this process of being a young aspiring researcher who's kicking against the pricks then to being zeitgeist, then you're an old fogey who's kind of past the, you know, your your stuff isn't anyone else's stuff anymore. You know, it's, and I think, but, you know, you can't stop yourself. As I said, just keep coming back around, you know, it goes around and around. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, there is that sense to it. But, you know, the other thing I was thinking about as well is that whole sense of um, one of those things that as a mature researcher coming back into, and after having done my PhD, is the back to that sense of um, play, um, the sense of being open to play, because I think there is that sense of professionalism where you start occupying your own mind in terms of outcomes, yeah. and you start saying, "Well, this has to be. What's this for? Where's it going?" Which is a really great functionalist approach to getting stuff done. But um, I think the and then you. That works really well. And then there's the other really hyper self-aware psychological approach where you, you're absolutely overly self-aware of what you're doing at all times. And that's two at certain times. Um, the thing that you stop doing is um, just allowing yourself to kind of tune out and just kind of go, well, that's all very nice. I'm just, but I'm turning off all the, I'm turning off all my um, various sources of inspiration, ideas, you know, switch, turn that all down to kind of really low and just kind of let myself see what happens. Um, just yeah. going to have a play, just and, and try to enjoy the process by looking at things, pushing things together that don't make sense, and allowing yourself not to be driven by worrying about an outcome and producing a, a definitive outcome, but just by seeing what, by going back into that experimental mode, you're purely saying, you know, if I put the gunpowder with the fire, what happens? And um, and, and, and and sometimes it's interesting. And sometimes you just go, well, I'm just going to, you know, burn that one discreetly and no one will ever know. Um, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think we're coming back to it. So for me, in, in the latter stages, you kind of mm. has very much been about rediscovering that play space because, you know, the PhD is very intense. I went through a lot of um, psychological issues, and which I've worked through and working through. Mm -hmm. And but coming back to that sense of why I'm making art, why I do it, why do I enjoy it, and having to come back to that square one um, was really much a case of saying, "Look, you have to allow yourself." Um, it's not a luxury, I should say. It's not a luxury. Um, it's, it's it's really important that you should keep a personal space within your own professional and an intellectual interest to enjoy. Really important to kind of remember some of those things, that sense of wonder and allow that to happen. Otherwise you don't recharge. 
Otherwise, you don't feel interested. You lose interest in the topic. You've yeah. got to keep kind of feeding that sense of wonder at one at one certain level. Um, and that was, you know, in terms of, um, and I know there are different schools of thought on this. In the past, I probably boxed things too firmly, but yeah. I do think um, there's a there's a school. It's like organising meetings with academics. Yeah. Um, if you just have an open ended meeting with academics, it can go for hours. It yeah. cover everything, <laughs> and I have no results. Um, but if you said to them, "Look, we're going to have a half hour meeting. This is purely about functionalist issues, right? Yeah. Okay, that's this is purely about administrative or governance or whatever." And then you say, well, "This is the next half hour is purely about this issue, okay?" And then you got thirty minutes, and then you can tell us about why you, the dog ate your homework and how that relates to your artwork. Yeah. And you, you know, you allow for those different spaces, but being aware enough, allow that of what they are, mm -hmm. but ha ha being able to kind of recognize them well enough to see them for what they are rather than allowing them just to kind of blur through those kind of a range of kind of stuff that can happen. Yeah. Even if they do blur, having been able to re re you know, reflect back and say, well, this is what happened here. Um, and, you know, and that's probably the biggest thing I think um, some of the things like more advanced research does. It mm -hmm. gives you that ability to look back and say, well, what happened here? Yeah. You know, closing there, that design loop. Is there any concrete examples of of your work that you might have where you can um, sort of show how this relates directly? Uh, yeah, I look at one of the, a lot of the examples I used to talk to people about in terms of understanding and not understanding what was going on because mm -hmm. um i used to the one i um and i've cited this in um my phd one of the things i used to have as in my early work paintings was this motif of i used to it kind of always have this kind of foot of a exposed one foot with a shoe on one sh sh foot with a shoe off yeah yeah um to a point that it got to giving to one artist talk and i hadn't realized that i was even doing it that someone said why do you have the left foot always exposed Mm -hmm. and, I, and I really couldn't answer why. And it really actually was through the process of the PhD and looking back and that the whole notion of haunting and um, psychological haunting and what, how things can affect us without even realising it, um, mm -hmm. which is, psycho, you know, the psychological impact. But um, in that sense that for me it referred to a moment um, in which uh, when I was 21, my dad died while I was on a train with him in India and we mm -hmm. got off the train and I just, all I remember is the, um, you know, his hand falling off the um, stretcher. He was under a blanket mm -hmm. and then later on you'd see a foot. And, they, and so that was one of those, there was one of those highly emotive images of that time. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it has clearly just sunk in. I had, and, you know, I know I've been playing with that, the doubling sense of psychology, you know, psychology in the postmodern. And there's a sense like you set up a Freudian joke for people to intentionally read something in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then so that you could then play upon people's psychological intention on reading things along with, you know, especially along the psychosexual, people want to read things in a certain way. Yeah. Um, is, you know, the, the, and playing against and with that expressionist trope of what, you know, comes out of like, if, if it's if it's black, it must be moody. If it's got by wire, it has to be violent. You can, all those things you can kind of play with. Play with. Yeah. But um, but what it turned out, kind of getting to that point for much further on in that design, you know, kind of design loop through the, through the kind of PhD, it was realizing is that part of the joke had also been on me because here I was setting up these situations of a psychologically fraught situation for which can become a, um, a litmus point or a, a catalyst for, to kind of generate um, real meanings and real authentic meanings from people. But at the same time, what I hadn't realized that my own psychology had slipped in um, a trigger as well. Yeah. And so it was, um, and that was interesting in terms of dealing with um, hauntology and, and um, some of those ideas that, you know, the inheritance of events has can be unconscious even if we don't realise it, um, you know, even for, the, for people who feel that they're the most self-aware people in the world yeah. will still impact on us in invisible ways. And that's both individually and culturally. I mean,
me, that was relative. The, I mean, the artwork has been being produced over a period of time mm -hmm. and continues to. So, um, uh, and I, so in, in terms of organizing people, but also looking at other people, other, you know, as a cura curatorially looking at other artists and other people interested in my field, um, that's always incredibly important because, you know, there's that sense of, um, you know, the, the, one of the old cliches for artists is, you know, you're sitting in a garret by yourself and, you know, you're plucking everything out of your own head. But what usually what that means is you, what you do is you're plucking your own previous assumptions and previous prejudices and previous other people's ideas out of your own head and just regurgitating them on the on the on, on the paper mm -hmm. um that's why you get kitsch the new kitsch but that's a different topic but um uh so that you know what really that kind of level of research and kind of investigative thing is to say well, well this is my approach to it but what mm -hmm. is well who what 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 is every what is my field I'm not, you know, to back away from that assumption that you're some kind of lone genius and realise that there's a whole lot of other people before and after some of um, that are contributing to this kind of discussion and, and they have different approaches to it and different ideas about what it means sometimes for me because I have a lot of interest in the decoration historical, a lot of that weaves then into the camp and people who then still deal with the camp and the decorative and the kind of like the whole senses of... Um, you know what masculinity and femininity and decorative and those things can be um so in that sense that it becomes a, something else um mm. and that's where when you're researching you have to say well i can't do decoration um you know I, if i just deal purely with decoration and, and and the gender affiliation and all the notion of gender affiliation with decoration I'm going to go off into a whole different PhD. I'm going to have to fine tune it down to the nth degree, and it's going to be about something else completely. So, in that sense, like, you kind of have to say, as an artist, you can say, "Well, that's really interesting. I can put that in my big pot, but in terms of my research pot, I just need to talk about this bit, you know, or even that bit, yeah. um, and 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 even that." Uh, yeah, as, you, as you know, you kind of shrinks down over time, and that's why that humility thing comes into it when you realize just. Um, there are so many things that you assumed and then come out in different ways. I mean, in terms of visual prejudice as well. I mean, I think that's why it's, um, even though I wouldn't say I'm like, a, I'm a postmodernist and I say someone like Jeff Coons was, um, you know, that supreme irony, the emptying out completely of content and meaning. Um, I, I was actually the flip side of that. People forget that, that there's the other flip side of that at the, the time going on. You can, I think behind yeah. me, I've got it. The, um, yeah, David Foster Wallace and the new authenticity. Mm -hmm. Unreadable, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> unreadable, but he was, you know, it, it's, it's, um, but it was very much a case of really trying to be in that kind of fraction, within that kind of scope of postmodernism, trying to get to a sense of being authentic and meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the thing people forget. And that, um, and so when you get to a stage, in anyone's research it's easy for some people then to say oh that's all rubbish and you kind of say well no unfortunately what you are still expressing um a point of view that's informed by the past if you deny it if, if that's the whole point of ontology if you deny it you're just what you're operating from is an um uninformed prejudice yeah uh, yeah rather than saying well if i at least acknowledge it i know what's happening and what may be influencing my results here rather I'm going to say working with the university was really good. Mm. Um, I mean, I the thing is that there are things that I got out of that I think everyone did during that COVID period. Mm. Um, I really like working with Monash, but I think there's a huge advantage of working with a university that you can physically <laughs> touch base with um, and be there and um, talk to people. Um, I, I, you know, I think working with an institution in that sense is really fantastic because it, it's like... Um, Again, this might be my religious background coming out, but <laughs> it's like existing within a broad church. Um, you, if you know, in a sense that here I'm in many respects, uh, you know, I'm a traditionalist in the sense that I love working with my hands, I love drawing and I love painting, and um, uh, working with people. As Monash has changed over the course of my PhD into a much more conceptually based institution, mm. um, meant that you know you're getting challenged in different ways.
and I think that's always been the great thing about working with another institution. It can be frustrating because, you know, you kind of feel like you may have started off wanting to work on rocket ships and then you know, <laughs> somehow you end up working on bicycles. And that's, that's, but, you know, it's 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 just the way that thing, that side of it is. Um, and, yeah. I, and I recommend it. I mean, it's not easy. I mean, I had a past student who's actually at USQ saying, oh, I want to do a PhD, but I don't want to do it if it's stressful. And I mean, you're kind of going, I don't think you can, <laughs> I don't think you can separate the two things. Um, in fact, I think it's better off if you, right at the beginning, admit that at certain points in time, this is going to get really stressful. You're better off getting your partner involved early on and sitting, sitting down with both people and say, look, this is going to be really stressful for both of you. This is not a, this is not an isolated thing. You know, it's going to, it's going to bleed out. Um, in, in so many ways that you won't even realize. And at the end of it is incredibly worthwhile. I kind of feel like I'm a, a, you know, if I was working within academia again, I'd say, well, I, you know, I have all these skills, but I still have those skills and how I apply them, mm. I guess it'll be up to me in the, in the future. Mm. But um, just in terms of artistically, it's given me um, in being able to kind of looking at that kind of generalist perspective and just being, you know, for me at the moment, I'm just saying, look, I'm just making art. Um, and it, it comes down to this weird thing where you kind of go, you know, you know, talking about the design loop. You kind of go, mm -hmm. I kind of feel like in a strange way, I've done this huge design loop back to when I was about 18 or 19. And saying, <laughs> well, why are you making it anyway? And you go, well, you know, for my own, you know, my own pleasure. And, and, and if people like it, you know, it's a lot more informed and all those things, but um, mm -hmm. you're kind of going, it's a, it's a, yeah, it feels like an enormous round the world trip, but um, yeah, I, it's better than getting stuck in the um, doldrums. I, I could have said that. And then try to say, look, why am I doing this? And quite honestly, um, I don't know if this is true for scientists, but or anyone else, but I, in the end, there's that awful truism like I, I do it because I, we can't stop mm -hmm. yeah you know it's 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 one of those things that I kind of I've always it's so much hat when I not doing it is usually a sign of the fact that I'm absolutely miserable yeah. um and it's usually a sign of um this is where the, the cliche of the tortured artist doesn't work for me <laughs> um is that I know that I'm personally a lot more emotionally and intellectually and um, personally, a lot stronger. We're going to sit down and do the work, and yeah. embrace that, and embrace the risks. I mean, that's the other side of it. I mean, that again is something I think would be true for anyone working there. You're going to kind of say, "Look, I've got to try this out and see what happens." There's that sense of big breath, go for it. Yeah, and that's that design loop sort of experimental yeah. process again. And and when you're doing the workshops, I guess is that your is that something that you sort of bring it across to the people who do your workshops as well? I try to. I mean, I think there's different ways. Um, again, teaching is, again, one of those really difficult things. That's why they've been one of those difficult issues within art schools. Mm. Um, you know, there was the old atelier model where we, you know, people would stand around which I, and kind of work and then kind of um, occasionally you get some feedback. And that was, I quite like that. But then... There's the opposite side of it that people really don't like that. So there's the other side of it, which is a kind of like the patent sip an approach to um, teaching art, which is you kind yeah. of you go in and the, you give them ten steps, in and you tell them, and you ha probably have to outline it pretty rigorously and say this is how you do it, and and you kind of like as an artist, they kind of well you, that's not true. There's about a thousand, you know, there's always a thousand ways to do anything, but for you know at least you know infinite number of choices, but um, that you know, so those two things often clash when you're trying to teach, um, because or, or, you know what you're trying to do is get people started, and at least kind of get over that fear, that level of fear is often what I would call it that step, and then try to get more comfortable with taking other steps, and then realizing it that they don't always need someone standing over their shoulder saying, you put the red there and you put the blue there and you use that kind of brush stroke. It's you know, that's immaterial in the long run. Yeah. Um, but it's just trying to get people to the point where they can kind of understand, you know, that they can do it and that they can, if it doesn't work, you know, as I keep saying to people, you know, I've got a PhD. You know, so, you know, 
But as I said, I think I've got, because I've been through that bigger loop, you know, you can say, you know how we're talking about loops and boxes yeah. and all that yeah. kind of stuff. You could say that within your own professional and research career, there's smaller loops of you going through things. And then, and then there's the bigger life cycle loop that you have and mm -hmm. that we have. And artists have like a, a big, a, quite a huge one actually, because we start quite young and then we have a, a we, we're young artists to about 35 and then we're mid, middle-aged <laughs> artists to about 65. And then we have them to have a meant to have a late career. We're still alive. Um, and so, you know, I'm going, I'm only 53. I've still got another eight years to go and survive this, whatever this stage is and however long it will go on for. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, at this point, that's kind of freeing as well because I just kind of go, well, I'm just doing my thing now. And Yeah, um, yeah. And is, um, I, is there any real, like, you've sort of opened up to that kind of playfulness and, and sort of, mm. but are there still challenges to sort of, to that, being able to pre sort of continue the kind of experimentation that you're doing? Uh, I think it's just always the same challenges that everyone does, which is time and money. Yeah. And when, you have, yeah. when you've got the time, do you have then, you know, if you're working, um, you know, and I think it's really hard. It's, I mean, I look at students these days, I think it's really, really hard because you're saying, oh, where's this notion of free time? You know, kind of this whole, yeah. you know, this the, the old union notion of having the idea that you have two days off a weekend. Um, yeah. And that the reason why you had all these ideas is that the wealth of a society wasn't necessarily through how much money we were able to make, but mm. also through the amount of what we can do in our time, our spare time, that we have the luxury of spare time. Um, and yeah. uh, so I'm... Um, you know, that's div diverging, but I'm basically saying, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm like everyone. I've just got the, um, I have, I now have the ability, I've got the space, I've got my materials, but it's like everyone else. I've got to have that, you've got to have the time and the sp mental space um, and to be able to pursue those works. So if anyone's out there wants to give me a million dollars a year for nothing, clearly I'm <laughs> thrilled. But, um, but it's, it's, um, but again, all these things have their consequence, and you know, and it does make you think about how you want to do it. And and, yeah. I, and as I said, looking at younger artists and um, younger researchers, you know, the pressure is very much on to try to address areas that's going to bring in a financial stream, so you can continue doing what you're doing. And a lot of them have do it brilliantly and are able to combine their interests. Um, yeah. yeah, and being open to that, I think that would be the one thing. Um, you know, in retrospect, if I. Oh, you know, well, yeah, that's not really going to work because you know me when I was younger. This was, I could have tried to tell myself when I was younger, but I wouldn't have listened. But I mean, I see if, I, if anyone who's at my age and listening, you say, well, just be willing to ups, kind of diversify those skill bases um, if you can, as you can, so that when you go on into this kind of later stages in life, you have more of this, you can do some of those things. Like, for example, I, I know that I have the, the, at the touch of death when it comes to computers. They really don't like me. Uh, and, and I mean, in a digital age, and I'm someone who, who kind of like computers look scared when I come next to them. And it, it's and um, it's one of those things. But in, in retrospect, you're saying, oh, well, you know, I wish I could have been different, but at the same time, now would be really great if I knew some of those skills rather mm -hmm. than saying, but, you know, I still get to things like Photoshop and I prefer to draw it by hand than doing it on the yeah. screen. Yeah. And it's easier for me to do it that way. That's but, an interesting thing too, where you now have, I guess, the emergence of tools which are more sophisticated uh, and are able to go from, oh, just yeah. to, you know, something like a Photoshop cut and paste image processing to now complete image generation. And yeah, yeah. that's a whole new, um, very recent, Change. Oh, yeah. No. I, it's like anything that, I mean, you, you, you kind of feel like you come back around to that whole Duchampian kind of argument, you know, because mm -hmm. they choose, you choose it, isn't that enough? Yeah. And I've seen some people do some great things. You've got to program, you know, it's like anything, you've got to program the computer to come up with the good stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it doesn't just randomly associate all these Wes Anderson mock-ups. Some of them are brilliant, yeah. Um, yeah. but the yeah. rain just happens. The computer doesn't just there spontaneously in the middle of the night start spewing out kind of... Um, Wes Anderson... Right? 
previews for <laughs> no it doesn't you know it's, it's like that and it's just one of those weird things it just didn't happen guys i mean there's someone there kind of pushing a button at the very least I mean, that's, that's that's probably the end result if we are living in a simulation it's it's going to end up converging on uh, a wes anderson film possibly but <laughs> It would be worse. Could be worse. <laughs> I was watching, I was re enjoy, I was inflicting my partner with Evil Dead 2 and Evil Dead 3. So think of it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's an alternative. Could be living in an endless zombie <laughs> movie, you know, the, the, the Walking Dead 452, you know, zombies versus Rambo versus kind of um, Creed. I don't know. You know, it, it would be awful. Oh, yeah, I'm sure someone will do it. It'll be, could be great.